Well, Laura, again, thank you for coming to Washington, D.C. This is the first time we've had you as our guest. It was a great pleasure to um, hear your, uh, about your monastery in Mexico City. Uh, of course, uh, we met about 15 years ago for the first time when you were a hieromonk. Uh, but uh, 15 years has passed and uh, many things have happened. Um, your monastery has uh, suffered through many difficult uh, hardships over the years. Uh, I would like to get to that, but first, uh, I want to hear a little bit about your background. I understand you were actually born in the former Soviet Union. Yes. Uh, well, thank you. It's it's an honor for me to be here, Father. Mm -hmm. Thank you for inviting me and for hosting me. It's a great opportunity for me to share about the life in Mexico and our mission work. Um, yes, I was born in the Soviet Union. Um, I don't talk much about it because I don't have much to tell about this. Uh, but you uh, have different blood on, in you. I mean, you, yes, your father yeah, yeah. and mother are different uh, yeah. ethnics. I was born in the Soviet Union. I was born in Georgia, in mm -hmm. uh, the Socialist Republic of Georgia. Uh, because my father is uh, half Greek and half Georgian. So I was born in Suhumi, on the Black Sea coast which was a uh, very big, it was a large uh, Greek colony for many years. And, um, but we left when I was four years old. Mm -hmm. So I don't have many memories about that. Perhaps, uh, yeah, the, the mark of my, my background, my origin, it's very important. And uh, of course, I feel closer to Georgia or to the Caucasus culture than to Greece. I mean, I, I'm a Greek, but not uh, Greek from Greece. Mm -hmm. um, I feel more related to, to Georgia as a culture. Mm -hmm. And uh, even my, my language, it's a different type of Greek. Now I speak regular Greek, but before I used to speak more the Pontian Greek, which mm -hmm. is uh, um, the Black Sea Coast? Uh, uh, yes, and it's a dialect. It's mm -hmm. closer to classic Greek. Mm -hmm. I understand uh, this uh, Pontian dialect, but now I don't speak because I don't have any chance to talk mm -hmm. with anybody unless I find uh, a Pontian Greek mm -hmm. who still speaks this language. Um, but my mother, my mother was Persian, so I am part Persian and uh, part Greek Georgian, and I always said Greek Georgian because for me it's the same, the same culture. Right. You were baptized as a child? Yes, I was baptized in, when I was in uh, in Suhumi. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I was ba baptized there in the Georgian Orthodox Church. Yes. Mm -hmm. And you were given an Orthodox upbringing? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, well, during the Soviet times, it was difficult to go to church, but I was very small. Uh, but then we moved to Turkey, and in Turkey, I was able to worship in uh, Greek churches mainly. Um, so, yes, I remember my childhood, my, the years I spent in Turkey, going to church very often, if not uh, two, two or three times a week, because I always enjoy the services. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. And then I understand that from, from Turkey, you ended up in Iran? In Iran, yes. Um, as a matter of fact, we had to leave Turkey because there, was, uh, there were riots against the Christians, mm -hmm. because uh, um, Turkey invaded Cyprus. Oh, yes and uh, we left and we left and we went to Iran because my my grandfather had a good position in the government uh, with the Shah and uh, we moved there because it was more convenient for my mother and for security reasons also for me mm -hmm. so I also spent uh, some years in Iran with uh, family but my mother was very ill so I I don't have uh, great memories of those years either because mm -hmm. she was she had leukemia and um, she mm -hmm. was most of the time she was ill. 
And she passed away in Iran? Uh, no, we left also due to the Islamic Revolution. Mm -hmm. So when the Shah left, we also left uh, Iran. And um, she died in France oh. because she went for treatment, but she she couldn't uh, resist. Her her body was very weak, so she died in a few months, in a couple of months later. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you ended up in, in Mexico. Uh, I went to Mexico because there was a big. Uh, community of uh, Iranians who went to Mexico precisely because the Shah of Iran went to Mexico. Mm -hmm. But uh, we only stayed there for a few months, like uh, five months, I think, at the most. And then uh, we went to France. But when my mother died, I went to New York because uh, these were my only relatives I had. And mm -hmm. uh, I was in New York with my, my father's family. Yeah. And where did you get, where were you educated? Well, here and there, but uh, um, in uh, New York I went to school, I went to uh, high school, I started mm -hmm. high school, yes. Mm -hmm. yes, yes. And your higher education? Your... Uh, in Mexico mainly, Mexico. yes, Mexico, yes, because uh, I went to Mexico um, and I, I was with the Greek bishop of Mexico, who took care of me, was my spiritual father. At the request of my father, uh, he took care of me. And um, in Mexico mainly, I, I, I went to college, but uh, when my spiritual father was murdered, coming out from the Greek cathedral in Mexico City, <laughs> so I interrupted my uh, studies and I left. And uh, I, I went to Japan. Why Japan? Well, because it's a place where I got a scholarship. You're well traveled, Father. <laughs> <laughs> well, I got a scholarship to study in a Jesuit university, the University of Sofia. And uh, I studied archaeology mm. there, yeah. But then you somehow ended up in the medical field? Yes, I went back to Mexico because I had nothing in Japan. Uh, but in Mexico, at least, I had uh, somehow some memories from my mother and from my spiritual father, and also the Greek church, which was uh, somehow abandoned after the, the death of my spiritual father. So I felt morally compelled to, to go mm -hmm. back to Mexico. Mm -hmm. And uh, I started studying medicine because mainly uh, I always wanted to study medicine. So my mother said no, <laughs> but uh, hmm. I wanted to study medicine. But at the same time, I wanted to be in the church. And uh, when my spiritual father died, he already had tonsured me a monk. So I was already a monk mm -hmm. when I went to Japan. Mm -hmm. Yes. All right. So uh, you received uh, an archaeological education, uh, medical, uh, and you were a monk. And uh, how did it come about that you organized a monastery in Mexico City um, and ended up in the church abroad? Yes, uh, I was for many years in the Church of Constantinople in Mexico City. Mm -hmm. I kept going, uh, I continued my studies in Mexico. Mm, I, I went to college also in the field of anthropology and history. But uh, at the same time, I was administrator of the Greek cathedral because there were many priests, different priests, who did, didn't last long. Coming and going. Yeah, coming mm -hmm. and going. And uh, the community was also upside down, so I had to... Somehow I tried to keep them together. I organized the youth and uh, also some classes for adults. And I was taking care of the church, of uh, all the needs, including uh, financial needs, because since I had a job, 
uh, my money was invested in the church. Right? I mean, whatever I made and whatever need uh, was in the church, I, I paid for it. So, um, I, I think I finally realized that there was nothing for me in Mexico because I stayed in Mexico in the Greek Orthodox Church uh, only because I was needed, but uh, I was not happy. Um, what I wanted to do is to, to study theology to, or to get into a monastery and um, to join a monastery. Uh, yes, of course, I thought about becoming a priest but uh, first I, I wanted to do other things. I mean, I wanted to, to get deeper into my own mm -hmm. faith. And uh, in Mexico, there was no way to, mm -hmm. to do it because in, at least in the Greek church, I mean, <laughs> I was the one who knew more and I was teaching the, um, the chanters, the acolytes, the readers, and I, I myself had to, uh, to sing the liturgy and uh, for me, my knowledge of orthodoxy was very limited, even though I was always studying, but it was very limited and I, I, I needed more. Mm -hmm. So um, I, went, I, I was planning to go to Buenos Aires because when my spiritual father um, was uh, shot because he didn't die immediately, uh, he lasted a whole week after that, uh, so he had time to talk to other people and to, to me. And there was a bishop, a Greek bishop from Buenos Aires, uh, visiting. He went to see him at the hospital, and uh, my spiritual father made him promise to take care of me. And he said, "Yes, I will take him to to Argentina, and I will take care of him." Um, so he, wa he always told me that uh, there was a place for me in Argentina and finally uh, he said, what if you find some other candidates uh, and bring them to Argentina and uh, we will make them novices and uh, maybe you can work in the university in the field of theology mm -hmm. and uh, or a college professor, so, something we will do with you, and but we will open a monastery there. So that was the beginning because uh, I thought about finding a monastery and I had two or three people who were always close to me and they were interested in the monastic life and we were planning to go to Argentina so I was in the process of um, finishing all my my duties and my academic duties in, in Mexico. And uh, but then, right at that moment, the Patriarch of Constantinople um, split the Greek Archdiocese of North and South America in three parts. So one was for North America, another one for Central America, and the other one for South America. So um, I was torn to wait. They, 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 they asked me to wait. They said that there are big changes. There, are, there will be metropolitans in these areas. So why don't you wait a little bit until a new metropolitan is appointed? And yeah, there was a metropolitan appointed for uh, Mexico and Central America whom I knew from before, and uh, he asked me to stay. And so I couldn't <laughs> go to Argentina. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said, at least uh, stay for a couple of years, just uh, to help me establish the metropolis. So I stayed, but uh, after that he said, well, what if we found the monastery in, in Mexico? And, uh, but that was not in my plans because, again, I didn't feel I knew much about, uh, neither about the monastic life or about the uh, Orthodox Church. And uh, I said, no, I, I, I want to go somewhere else. 
I want to go somewhere else and I want to uh, to study. So finally, I left the metropolis of Mexico and uh, it was right at the time when I had more success in my life was uh, academic, was an academic. I, I, I had everything. I had um, much... Uh, uh, I was a famous person because I was working with the government uh, in the religious field and uh, I was working also as a physician and uh, I had everything anybody will want, okay? Mm -hmm. But that was not my goal. I, I gave up everything and I went to look for the will of God and um, as a simple monastic. And this is how I, I joined the, the Church of Jerusalem in America. But there was not much in America either in the Church of Jerusalem because it was a new community of Palestinians mainly. And uh, I went to Jerusalem. I spoke to the Patriarch, Patriarch Irineus in those mm -hmm. years. And uh, actually he's the one who told me to go into the church abroad. Really? Yes. He said, uh, you should go to the church abroad because your personality fits perfectly mm -hmm. in the church abroad. And of course I knew the church abroad. I had many friends in the church abroad. And um, they, I, I, I think of uh, all the churches, yes, it was the church abroad, the one who attracted me the most. Mm -hmm. Why didn't I join before? Well, first of all, because there was no church in Mexico. And I tried, I tried because I spoke to Vladika Alexander Miliant from Buenos Aires. And uh, I asked him if there was a possibility to found a, a, a mission in Mexico. But uh, he was already very ill, Ill. and uh, mm -hmm. he, he couldn't do it. And he said, well, let's wait. Let's see if I get a little bit better. So it was just a plan. And uh, also at the beginning, I thought it was a Russian thing. So <laughs> the church abroad, I'm not Russian, so maybe I cannot fit in the mm -hmm. church abroad. Um, but yes, I went to the church abroad and uh, through some of my friends who were clergymen and uh, I... But you were not a uh, clergy, clergyman? Then. No, 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 no. I, I was a simple monk. Simple. I was a schema monk, mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, I spoke to uh, Vladika Kirill, Archbishop Kirill, and uh, he received me. He received me along with the other two monks whom I had because they were already made monks mm -hmm. not by me but because since, since we had the project of founding the monastery in Buenos Aires they were tonsured monks before not by me by, by other uh, priest monks mm -hmm. and uh, so the three monks were received into the church of Rome by Archbishop Kirill. So you were living as a brotherhood with these other monks? Mm -hmm. Yeah, at that time, yes, because since we had the project of uh, going to Buenos Aires, we decided to live together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And when were you uh, ordained a priest monk? Uh, I was ordained in, two, uh, in 2006. 2006. Uh -huh. In uh, um, Holy Trinity Monastery in Jordanville by Metropolitan Lavre. Yeah, and we met them. I yes, believe, right? yes, 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 yes. He 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 ordained me a hierodeacon and then a hierom monk. So I served in in Holy Trinity Monastery. I I, I was there for about uh, half a year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the monastery is uh, dedicated to the Holy Trinity. Yes. And you have what about nine? Uh, now we are seven. 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 Mm -hmm. yes. And. Uh, Tell us about the life of the monastery. Um, 
Well, it's a unique monastery because uh, we are an urban monastery. Traditionally, mm-hmm. monasteries, Central, one of the largest yes, cities in the world. Yes, mm-hmm. traditionally the monasteries are outside the cities in a peaceful place or in a village or in the mountains. Um, but it was not really our choice. Uh, Metropolitan Love requested me to to found a mission in Mexico, the Russian mission. My plans were to go somewhere else, to join a monastery elsewhere. And uh, I had spoken to Metropolitan Love about it and he agreed. He agreed and uh, uh, our commander at Luke, Murianka, he also agreed that I should, we should move to Holy Trinity Monastery because he said uh, we have much space and we, we need people. So in Jordan, yeah, if you are already monks, well, you can come over and just join the Brotherhood. But Metropolitan Love requested me to open the Russian mission because he read some letters from uh, Vladika Alexander Milliant who were given to the Metropolitan by uh, uh, Vladik Alexander's sister. And uh, these letters never got to the hands of Vladik Alexander. And uh, the Metropolitan said, I read these letters and they are from people from Mexico. Um, these Russian families want to have a Russian mission in Mexico. So you're the only one who can do it. So go back to Mexico. And uh, this is why we had to open what we had in Mexico City uh, as a skit and then at the same time open the small chapel to minister the Russians. And um, that was the beginning, but we, we started from zero, Father. We, we didn't have much. Uh, even though we were a community, but uh, at the beginning, when we were in the already in the Russian Church abroad, we had more experience because we had traveled together uh, to different monasteries in different countries, and we lived in some monasteries for several months mm-hmm. together. So in those days, we already had um, good training mm-hmm. in the monastic life in different Orthodox countries. So um, this was the beginning and from the beginning I I decided that I, I had to celebrate in Church Slavonic because it was not a, a Mexican mission, it was a Russian mission to to minister the Russians, the, the Russian immigrants who were there in Mexico. I wasn't sure how many there were, but uh, uh, the first Easter we had, um, at least we had about uh, 80 people or 100. So I realized that uh, there was much work to be done. Mm-hmm. And um, we started from there. And, um, but you don't speak Russian, do you? Uh, not much, Father, no, but understand. I, underst- I understand. I understand. Mm-hmm. So you communicate things. with these people, the Russians, uh, in Spanish? In Spanish, mainly, mm-hmm. yes, mm-hmm. yes. And uh, But uh, the fathers, they are studying uh, Russian. Mm-hmm. We speak many other languages, but mm-hmm. uh, uh, the fathers, they, they speak also Serbian, so it's easier for them to, to understand Russian. Uh, for me, I have no time to study. That's my only problem. I have no time. Uh, so you 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 do the the major ser- services on Sunday in Church Slavonic. Uh, yeah, a hundred percent. But what about Slavonic. the uh, small services, the weekday services? For also them? in Church Slavonic. Only when we go to the skits, uh-huh. we do in Spanish, mm-hmm. in, in the skits. Um, sometimes, when uh, le- let's say it, it's very late, so perhaps one of the fathers will decide to serve in Greek because we speak Greek, this is the common language yeah. of the three of us and uh, well, if they decide to, to serve in Greek, but it will be just for the, for the monks, mm-hmm. not for the people. When, when it's open to the people, we celebrate in Church Slavonic, but when we have a, 
um, like a baptismal a wedding, then we do Spanish and uh, Church Slavonic. Why Spanish? Because mainly we will have uh, Guess that, so. yeah, uh, yeah, but just two, three Russians and perhaps 50 Mexicans. Mm -hmm. So we have to do more Spanish. Uh, and it is not just uh, in order to attract the, the people, but uh, I mean, there's no reason to do it uh, in churches, only in churches Slavonic. Have you attracted uh, locals, local uh, Mexicans? To the yes, church? yes. Uh, I will say that 70% uh, of our community are mixed marriages. So um, we try to bring the non orthodox exposed into the community otherwise i know that we would lose we could lose the whole family and uh, i sit with them we talk about different issues not precisely about religion and this is how i i attract them because i guess many people in these days think that uh, the monks are very ignorant but when they see that I have uh, academic training and uh, that I am a, a doctor, then they, they listen to me and uh, they say, well, perhaps if father is a doctor and he is also a clergyman in the Orthodox Church, it means that there's something else. Mm -hmm. That's the, not yeah. That's And uh, yeah, many have uh, joined our church. Yeah. I understand from the talk you gave uh, at, at the luncheon today that uh, the monastics support themselves by working outside of the monastery. Yes. Um, yeah, mainly because our, um, our community is made of new Russians. So all of them are immigrants, new immigrants. They have children, they pay rent, their children go to school, and many of them go to the Russian school which they also have to pay. There is a Russian school in the Russian embassy. Mm -hmm. And, um, well, they don't have... Uh, they can't afford to, yeah, to they support the money. Yeah, they can't afford to support. Uh, somebody told me that uh, only the Russians give when they have much to give, okay? Mm -hmm. So, but when they try to make a living, it's difficult for them. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult. So, we... Uh, all the monks have... Um, a lay profession, so we all work outside the monastery, but uh, whatever we make goes to support our mission work. I mean, and this includes the the renting of the uh, of the place where we live, where we worship, where we have uh, the parish, the main parish in Mexico. Mm -hmm. Yes. You also mentioned that you have uh, 10 small parishes that, yes, that yes. depend on the monastery? Yes, yes. We have uh, many different communities that we visit from time to time. Now it has become a bit more difficult because there's much crime. Before we used to take the car and just drive around to different cities, but now it's not possible. And uh, we have to fly only. Really? Yeah. And Mexico, it's a very large country, and it's very expensive. It's costly for the communities. But there are some communities who, they even though they are small, they they can afford it and they, they want to. And we visit them more often. And uh, we go and serve a, a liturgy and whatever they need, yes. Mm -hmm. What are your relations with the other Orthodox uh, groups in uh, Mexico. We don't have uh, relations with them, not really. Um, it's a bit complicated. Uh, we have uh, three jurisdictions um, in addition of uh, the Russians. We have the Church of Constantinople, the Church of Antioch, and the OCA, mm -hmm. and the Russian Church, Moscow Patriarchate and Rockwar. Um, but uh, these three jurisdictions have uh, metropolitans and one archbishop. So I am the only one who is not a bishop. And it's difficult to deal with bishops because everyone wants to take the control of the rest. So I just don't associate with them. We, we, we are 
extremely busy mm -hmm. trying to minister our people and uh, taking care of their needs because mm -hmm. there's much uh, uh, there's much to do there are big problems major problems especially where with mixed marriages and uh, we have to hire some uh, attorneys to counsel our people and uh, I have come to some agreements with the immigration department to help our people and um, I'm working very much against uh, women trafficking and domestic violence so I'm a well-known figure because for those reasons mm -hmm. yeah and also we give uh, medical attention in Russian uh, to whoever needs it or even people who have no finances we help them we even had to pay some funerals from people who had no financial means mm -hmm. we paid for the whole funerals yes so to complicate things you've been through the monastery has been through very extensive hardships in the past few years right could you maybe tell us about that yes uh, first of all the the rent is very expensive father um, the place where we live it it's very nice it's a medium-sized house but in downtown area it's very convenient because um, it's in the center of the city and in a large city of uh, 26 million it's difficult to get around but if you are in in the center it's easier for the people mm -hmm. to to get there so we try to to keep it at any cost but it's becoming more expensive every time and uh, we cannot afford it anymore uh, even with all the monks working uh, yes yeah but because we also have two skits ah. and uh, we have to take care of this, this is outside the city yes two mm -hmm. skits outside the city but and these skits uh, belong to you outright or yes or? yes mm -hmm. and uh, also uh, i had uh, many health issues and uh, this uh, made things more complicated because I at one moment I, I, I had to be under medical treatment and I was hospitalized and uh, I still get uh, uh, some medical attention. And you suffered through the uh, earthquake? Several earthquakes rather, several earthquakes. Uh, just in September we had three major ones and uh, last uh, Tuesday when I left Mexico to come to New York uh, that day I left early in the morning but by noon before noon there were three earthquakes in one hour yeah did you do damage to the monastery? Uh, yeah mainly on the cupola and uh, on the glasses but the glasses are or not not the windows but glasses which, which are which cover part of the walls and uh, it's very difficult to fix those things because the the house it's uh, almost 100 years old uh, so you need a special permissions mm -hmm. to repair these things it's and a historic, historical it, site it, it's regulated yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. and uh, the landlord doesn't want to fix it unless we agree to pay um, the rent that he wants but the rent is being increased uh, like every six months and uh, I, I think uh, in few months by July I'm thinking that uh, we have to move out we have to find another place because first of all we cannot fix it and uh, it will be right in the rainy season and with the rain all the rain gets into the monastery and uh, but I was thinking about uh, splitting the the parish and the monastery the monastery is not a problem because we have our salaries we could pay rent okay but if we rent a smaller house we will not be able to have the parish 
in the monastery. So that's the problem that we are confronting. What do we do? We need to open the parish in another place because we cannot keep supporting. Um, my Archbishop even told me uh, a year ago that he came to Mexico. He said, Father, you already supported the mission work and also now you are a deanery and uh, you are supporting. After 10 years, I think it's time for the people to to support it. And I said, yeah, but it's a bit complicated. It's not so easy. Mm -hmm. It's not an easy issue. I think we need at least another 10 years to for the community to be... To teach them to yet. take care of themselves. Yes, yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, yes, God willing and through the prayers of all our people, we, we may find a place, the right place mm -hmm. to, to move the parish, because this is what concerns me the most, the parish, because we could move even to an apartment, but, but uh, we would not be uh, able to, to keep the parish open, and th this is the main uh, parish. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Father, very much for that, and uh, thank you for coming, and uh, I hope that uh, uh, we can give help to you. Thank you. And that uh, the people who uh, heard your words will uh, understand the importance of uh, supporting our Holy Orthodox faith in the country of Mexico. God bless your work. Thank you, Father, and keep us in your prayers. Very good.